On patreon.com slash consensus on reality you will find bonus episodes, written content and much more. This recording contains an exclusive follow-up and bonus episode only on Patreon. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to another edition of Consensus on Reality. Uh, for tonight's interview, we are joined by Christopher Forgus, CF, uh, comic book artist. Is that the right comic book artist? Yeah. Sure. Um, musician responsible for such um, projects as Kites, Brown Recluse Alpha, Mark Lord, Daily Life, Universal Cell Unlock. Thanks for joining us tonight, Christopher. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Very nice. Um, so Ben, I don't know. Did you want to start? Oh yeah. I was thinking. Uh, have you been getting like a lot of spam calls lately? No. None. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. No. Oh man, it's been all day for me. All day. Have you been trying to get me to be spam call? Oh no, no, I don't have your number. <laughs> but I'm... Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really. I guess I've been getting some spam phone calls, but I don't really answer them. It's just kind of like numbers that come up. No, you don't answer. What happens to you, Ben? Well. The last one I got was a survey about the chief of police and if I approved of him, but that wasn't who it really was, so I I hung up. And um, I'm just starting to feel like my phone isn't really the private place it used to be, you know? (laughs) Hell yeah. Um, So, Christopher, (laughs) let's talk about uh, how you got into making comics and music. I mean, it's two kind of trajectories. I mean, we could definitely talk about maybe the relationship between your music and your comics as well and uh i guess if it if you kind of see it as being like one total body of work or if you kind of like separate them i mean they are separate but i think more and more i think of them as related um i started i think just from living in the middle of nowhere and there wasn't a lot of things in general around um but there was comics in the newspaper so that was the kind of drawing that i was seeing i liked drawing i liked comics but even that you just would never even see one they were hard (laughs) they were hard to get (laughs) it's so hard to imagine but uh you know like maybe my babysitter had like an older brother and I would see one and it would just be amazing. And then it would be like five months, maybe a year, more than a year before I'd see another one. But I would see the newspaper strips. I like that. I went to the local library and got out a book of like old newspaper strips and uh, eventually found out about zines and stuff. My dad had a little home business, so he had a Xerox machine, a small one, and I would just annihilate the toner on it. Um, <laughs> but he would let me do it. And then he was a paramedic. um, And again, we lived in a small town. So there was a scanner for if you were a paramedic, if you're a firefighter, it was like volunteer, I think some of it. So it was just one channel for like the police, the fire, the paramedics. That was all that's needed because it was such a small town. So it was always on with the squelch up really high. Mm-hmm. So it'd be dead silent most of the time, but then it would come on at multiple times a day, there would be tones and they would do these like, I don't know, these like ritualistic things they have to do on the, those kind of channels, you know, 
test mm. the emergency system or whatever. Right. So I just remember hearing those kinds of pitches and voices and stuff all growing up. And I, my father also taught electronics in the Coast Guard. So by the time I got interested in building synthesizers, he had already moved on and gotten rid of all of that stuff. And the things he had tried to teach me when I was way too young, I didn't really understand, but it did make me feel comfortable with the tools mm. and make me feel as if it was something I could do in the same way, like, oh, I can cut this piece of wood and screw this together or something. Just, it didn't seem maybe as daunting as it would have, you know? Right, right. But, what were uh, what were some of the like those early comics that you were first seeing? Do you remember like what they were? Um, there, there was a Silver Surfer comic that was the first one I ever bought at the mall with my mom from Walden Books, hmm. and it uh, had Mephisto in it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I just it was. Uh, you know, old newspaper comics, or maybe you'd see like a few panels of a Windsor McKay thing that would blow your mind. But it was just, it was not easy to get stuff back then, not until I had a car. I feel, yeah, yeah that must have had a pretty foundational um, influence on your style, though, because your stuff kind of, I could see that it reads in the way that a lot of those old news strip comics do. And the way that your stuff isn't always um, dialogue driven, but there's kind of like that auditory element to like the, the graphics and stuff and the way they move and the way the action moves through the frames and stuff. I feel like that's something pretty endemic of like a lot of like 1930s news strip stuff and some of those not even having dialogue at all. Yeah, because the rules were not, there was no, there was very few conventions then so people were still figuring out how are we going to use text and how are we going to make panels and just some of the drawing is really whacked out um i don't know they're cool <laughs> but, um they're creative in that way with a capital c like they're actually like there's nothing there so people are just going about it and doing what occurs to them searching for things that work it's a strange medium because it, you know, it's a way, it's almost like an industrial art. People have to make deadlines and essentially they're just illustrators. You know, those guys back then were illustrators for other purposes that were like, that was a job you could do at the newspaper, do a cartoon or whatever. Right. Right. So it's supposed to be just one trick in your deck of cards, but it comes its own thing. But what I'm trying to say is like, that deadline aspect or that industrial art aspect um, of just having to make sales is kind of interesting, the way that can motivate people stylistically um, and the way they can be really, you know, competitive with themselves um, once there's other people out there doing it. I don't know. Yeah. And also there is something about a sonic quality maybe or some onomatopoeia quality to some of those drawings or raw drawings in general and i definitely feel a synergy between energetically between the drawing and the sound mm -hmm. yeah were you were you like exposed to any sci-fi stuff early on i know you mentioned silver surfer which is has that grand like cosmic element to a lot of it the um forgetting the one what's the one artist's name uh Mo, Mo, Mobius or whatever, yeah. Mobius, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but were you exposed to like a lot of other sci-fi stuff? Because there, there seems to be like a common thread of sci-fi injected into a lot of your your comics and stuff. Yeah, I just I have always loved it. I think, yeah, I don't know. When I was really little, there was Doctor Who on PBS with Tom Baker. Mm -hmm. All those Tom Baker episodes, that whole era is just kind of magical. Looks really good um they use film for the outdoor shots and video for the indoor shots so there's this weird kind of uh jump that happens when they go outside i don't know such a cool inspired thing and that's bbc radiophonic workshop like peak time 
Delia Derbyshire did the theme music. Yeah. I think PBS in general, probably, because even if it wasn't science fiction, but I remember they used to use stuff for the from the first Kraftwerk record, like with flutes and stuff. You know, that stuff is really great. Mm. It's like electronics and flutes and um, kind of like groovy and tough, like can or something, you know, very yeah, yeah. crowdy. And they would use that for bumper music. Um, I remember the intro for three, two, one contact, just like had a slow motion of a water drop hitting the surface and things like that. I think when you get to certain levels of nature, then there's a science fiction feeling. And I think again, the fact of just like going outside and seeing woods and then there's just woods and woods and woods. It's almost like if you stare at the color orange and you shut your eyes, you see blue it's just like looking at the woods you just start thinking about something very far in the future yeah or like a, a woods could be in the distant past or it could be in the far in the future or it could be right now it's just a place where you can kind of time travel in a way oh that's cool yeah i like that hmm. do you um do you find like inspiration in like the formal kind of uh way nature looks like do you do you find that kind of creeping into your work i mean it's a tall tall order or i mean yeah forever out forever and always <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i guess you know if i'm doing a life drawing in a sketchbook whatever um the entire time i'm just filled with despair and embarrassment and um it's just going terribly from the first line and then it just gets worse and worse. Um, the longer I keep, keep it up and then the longer I keep it up, the more humiliated I become because I, I'm stubbornly continuing to act like I can draw or something. <laughs> Cause I'm, the thing is right in front of me and I'm looking at it and it's just perfect and gorgeous and mysterious and ineffable and, mm. um, hidden in plain view and, just something I could never control or understand. And then I'm, I'm trying to draw this fucking thing. Um, and it looks terrible. And then usually a few days later, I look at it and then I see it as a drawing. Mm. And then I like the drawing. Mm. Um, and I like the drawing because of that deformation and that misunderstanding and that failure yeah. has, has charm. That's the human charm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you But yeah. nature's yeah. strange, yeah. Yeah. Um when you're writing and like constructing a story, is there like an element of um improvisation in terms of the storytelling? Um I'm thinking kind of specifically of this this little book that you've you've made here um called Osipno. Um mm -hmm. and there's kind of like it's a really nice little simple story. And then there's this beautiful interlude in there that kind of just like sweeps over and it's, it's, it feels very alive. Um, but it also feels like you could have just like moved into that interlude in a moment, like while making this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one, that's part of a, a trilogy, a little series. The third one, which is not, uh, done yet it's well a lot of it's done but it's not out yet there's Osipno which is an anagram for Snoopy um, which the initial idea was just I'm going to attempt a funny dog comic as a challenge because people often when they find out you make comics they suggest oh I have an idea for a comic for you it's about a cat and uh, they're hungry and then the owner you know and it's just, they have no idea like what I draw. Sometimes even when they do know what I draw, they're like, oh, that would be a great con. It's like, I'm never going to do that. So that way I had an answer of like, this is my, my funny dog comic. So a sip now, Snoopy. The second one is called Cloudburst. That one's out, but sold out. And then there's a third one that's part of the same continuum that's called Puzzling Scars. And they're all made uh in an experiment to try a new way of constructing a story in the old days a lot of it would be improvised or you kind of 
you have no idea what you're doing. You're trying to drum something up. So you try to put some panels together, put a few pages together. You discover some things. But if you're writing, you can use a word processor and you can shuffle paragraphs around all the live long day. If you're making movies, it's the same aspect ratio. Whatever image is there can replace the one that's there. With comics, you have panels in an arrangement on a page that could be really complex and interlocked. And each page becomes the module, unless all of the panels are the same size. So the panels in that, in their simplicity, are designed to be modular fills. And then the panels were drawn um, sometimes in order, sometimes out of order. Sometimes there were other drawings that I made that were initially not intended to be part of the story, but then flipping through, I just kept imagining them as part of the story and then kind of grouping things together um, by theme or by idea or just asking why or what if, you know, there's a situation and then you reverse engineer it. For instance, uh, the guy who did Nancy, this really great gag strip. Um, I think if you look up comic strip in the encyclopedia, it's a, it's a p panel from Nancy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the guy that made that is Ernie Bushmiller, um, genius level guy. But he would just flip through the Sears and Robot catalog, find an object like a broom or something, draw a panel based on a broom. And then he'd do like six or seven other panels, all just kind of absurd things. And those would be the punchlines. And then he would reverse engineer the gag from there. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of fiction writers say the same thing. If you have an ending, you can work towards the ending. Um, so I found sometimes when I'm drawing something, there's a sequence happening, something pops out, or maybe you have a vague idea about the larger story, but there's one scene of it that's really uh, clear to you. So I always start there. Sometimes I think that's the beginning, and then later I find out it's in the middle or it's in the end. Or mm. I think I'm drawing the ending, but then I slide that around. I've just learned there's a lot of mutability. I think when I was younger, I felt bad about whatever I did because I felt like there was some mysterious way to tell stories that real people knew that I didn't know, <laughs> and it would be impossible for me to learn. But I feel like the more I've worked with it, the more I realize it's just like anything else. If you know, if it sounds good, it sounds good, and yeah. if it reads right, it reads right. You know. But I mm. like to more and more. I think I've been experimenting with ways of working to build stories, uh, just for trying to grow. I guess, and I, I guess, yeah, just still that feeling of like, what's a story? Is this? Um, is this interesting to me? <laughs> um, does this, what does this have to offer? You know, just trying to find a way to make something that I would be excited to read or excited to find or something. Mm. Nice. Oh, yeah. Same with music, just trying to make music yeah. that I want to hear, you know, right, right. that I don't feel like exists or something. Yeah. yeah there's yeah. kind of nothing more pure than that. Right? Do you find like uh, some sort of like feedback or synergy between your life and, and whatever you're working on at the moment? Like, is there ever any kind of sort of uh, interact, not like basing a comic or music on your life as simply as that, but do you find any kind of strange interplay? Yeah, everything leaks in, but not in the way people would think. Like sometimes people are very adamant, really insistent. They're like, oh, well, this character's me. <laughs> and that's because you know me. and it's, That's not true, you know? <laughs> Um, in all different ways. This character looks like me, this character acts like me, but I've never based a character on a friend and I've never based a character on myself, but everything leaks in. But I usually don't see it till long after it's uh, finished. Huh. I don't really know when it's happening. I certainly don't understand what's happening when I'm drawing whatsoever, you know, hmm. and I don't want to know. I'm never... If I do that, I'm dead. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's funny because I was gonna ask. Uh, you're probably familiar with it, but like within, um, you know, like esoteric practices and stuff. There's the idea of like hyper sigiling or like uh, 
telling true lies. Uh, usually it just involves like writing and stuff and journaling and kind of like manifesting through writing. Um, and I was curious if like, have you ever like felt caution about like the potency of your stories and, and if they would like begin to superimpose kind of piggybacking on what Ben had just asked there? That's an interesting question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, that's a little hard to answer. Yeah. But, um, I, I definitely consider that, or I think what you have in your mental grip, um, certainly affects things. What you're observing is affected by your observation of it and what you're observing is partially what you're creating, you know? So, yeah. And you're putting that in people's hands, um, and bringing them to a myth really essentially. Um, so yeah, does it, it, yeah. (laughs) In some ways I've tried to put these considerations aside because of times in my life where things got a little confusing and hairy. Um, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to put uh, thinking maybe that there was patterns Right. And um, like maybe being a little victimized by that, or not, vi- maybe that's the wrong word, but I don't really know. There's a lot of things that happen that I still don't really understand. And I think there's a temptation to understand and there's a temptation to think um, that you know something, but there's that, that phrase, um, it's mostly about using power tools or something like that, but it's a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I feel like we're always operating with just a little bit of knowledge, no matter what we see or what we learn. It's, it's always Hmm. good to like be cautious in a way. So I, I do know what you're talking about, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm reluctant to even get into it because I don't really, it's just I put it aside. I think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean because of stuff stuff that's happening. Maybe to, someday I'll pick those questions up again in a more direct way. Or something. yeah, it's, yeah. I feel it, like it can be so scary, right? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it's a it almost certainly. feels like a like a paranormal kind of feeling or something. Uh, as I mean, it's certainly happened to Dave. We talk about it all the time on here, and it's happened to me in my writing. Like things start to get uh yeah hairy is a good word yeah Yeah, the more it Um, gets it's like hook in you the more you're chasing patterns you kind of like i I feel like you often don't get led into realizations but you get led to more hallways and, and corridors and stuff like that and the mystery just kind of swells um so it is that dangerous terrain um when you're playing with your perception like that and and your pattern recognition and stuff. But it's kind of a territory we always ask people about, especially in writing and stuff, because uh, I don't know so much of talking about like um, occult stuff or uh, paranormal stuff is really, it's all people's narratives, you know, like it's just all stories. Um, It's all experiences and stories. So you kind of always have to, consider that the relationship between truth and fiction and and how things manifest in the world through story you know um it's always up for consideration um but i guess i'm curious have you have you ever maybe switching more to back to music stuff um have you ever kind of considered the process of like playing live as uh maybe being analogous to some kind of like ritual or something because i remember seeing you play so so long ago in in the early 2000s and um all of your synths and stuff were kind of had like symbols painted on them and stuff almost like sigils and and stuff um have you ever kind of considered it like that or is, is it something totally different i think at that time yeah definitely it was like that um and just about kind of assuming a kind of power focus um 
gathering all the energy in the room, gathering all the uh, grief <laughs> and the good things too, and trying to just make a giant uh, ball <laughs> and make that kind of expand, you know? Mm. Um And uh, I think that project, too, maybe with the way things were made, the instruments and the uh, lighting and things, um, was all still, again, coming a lot out of, I think, my background or my childhood or something. Um, kind of a drawing from, like, New England, New England energy. Mm. Um, and not a... Not, uh, Celtics, Dunk, Sox, Patriots energy. That's not quite what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although that's a part, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and then I think I, I really, I really, really had um, high stakes in my mind, I think, for performing then. Um, I really wanted something to happen um i wanted violence i wanted peace <laughs> you know um i wanted real change um or i'm just remembering the slogan from a realist side shirt real death real change <laughs> your ability to change <laughs> oh yeah great great slogan um <laughs> but yeah real death real change and um, I don't know something about a something out of human scale, I guess, and some kind of force of power that's out of human scale, mm. including volume, including instruments that touch frequencies that are not human, um, that are not you know not perceptible by humans necessarily, but are still present and possibly like probably having an effect. Ultrasonics and subsonics. Um, and just determining, like drawing a line, saying this is not that. You have your everyday life filled with people you despise, including yourself. Mm -hmm. You have demands and you have um, bills to pay. You have uh, your bullshit. And there, it's just, they're just making a separate space from that, I guess. And there's nothing there. Um, but determining that with a lot of strength, um, that empty space or something, I don't know, something like that. It's hard, hard, I guess, to put into words, but then at some point, I think I went through this crisis and change and, uh, my whole relationship to performance changed. Um, and I tried a lot of other things that were either, willingly abject um like sitting and playing blank tapes and eqing blank tapes um which i would never sit before you know or i would never play a tape or anything like mm -hmm. that so um you know it's not live electronics and it's not even interesting yeah i remember that yeah. right you had a you were pretty like adamant about like no the lack of time distortion in your music and stuff originally correct yeah which was something i shared with jessica rylan mm -hmm. um you can't go unmentioned because she she taught me you know in a way like taught me everything i know about electronics or she taught me so 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 much and troubleshooted my circuits and held my hand and was just like so instrumental in me being able to you know get going with that um but yeah nothing that messes with time just the inspiration being more like um someone just playing a flute and reciting poetry or something or mm. um soft cell just to send you know three identical synthesizers and a microphones you know, or White House or something, just like the same synth, like two of the same synth and a microphone. 
just like purity, simplicity, nothing to hide behind. Um, practice every day. Know the instrument so, 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 so well. Like it's like it's your saxophone or whatever. Mm. Yeah. So that's the inspo. Yeah. And still to this day, I'm always just trying to get rid of gear. And I just want to get to the point where it's like, I always want it to be as little as possible. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of something I've always envied about um, a couple of those um, Ankyo, like Japanese lowercase musicians, is is that it's uh, like the Tashimaro Nakamura with the no input mixing board and Sashiko M um, playing that sampler um i think it's a kai sampler maybe um but it's a very um focused on just like this one practice of this is having this piece of gear that's kind of seen as like a complement as being your one instrument i've always been envious of and and jess ryland was somebody like that as well who was so uh integral to that American noise scene in the aughts and was kind of a force um, and, and had that singular voice as well. But that um, just that deep understanding of, of the electronics that she was playing. And like you said, just kind of yeah. know, knowing every, where every, every like, uh, you know, millimeter of that knob on that synth is going and stuff. Um, yeah. And no, I mean, like it's a, it's a perverse fascination that, becomes entangled with your emotions, <laughs> you know, um, like what the gear is doing and what it creates. And maybe even with more chaotic circuits, maybe there's even, there must be some kind of quantum effects, you know, hmm. when the, the gates are that precarious um, and that indeterminate, I'm sure being around it and having a relationship with it changes who knows but yeah um really uh, basically like a private thing i guess too so maybe in that way the ritualistic thing is true in that way too where it's like yes i'm playing the show and yes i'm here it's been like publicized in some way but by the same token like this is this is in a way a private thing or it's something that I would be doing privately anyway. And I think in fact, when I started touring doing kites, people really didn't do that very often. Um, there weren't a lot of noise shows then. Um, it was very looked down on. It's kind of music for losers or like, if you can't even have a punk band, I guess you can like do that. And it's like really pathetic, you know, <laughs> Um, so that was kind of the vibe, you know, people heard about noise. They pictured like an enormous folding table full of like broken bullshit, you know, and like toys and things, you know, I don't know. Um, Fisher price outfitted. Yeah. I don't know what the, you know, it just had a, it was a bad, had a bad name. Um, so it was not, I guess I'm just saying it was not something you did to win points or accolades or, uh, be cool at that time. And it was, I think, genuinely shocking for some people at that time touring with the volume and the physicality and stuff. Um, you know, that was interesting. This, I, I still remember this one show. I forget where the hell it was. Everybody told me how bad the neighborhood was. It was just one of those shows where like every single second, someone's stressing like, mm are you wearing your pants? Do you like, do you still have your shirt on? It's like, yeah, I'm good. Um, you know, did you leave anything anywhere? Um, but I played and this guy came up to me and he said, uh, he was like, yo, during your set, um, I took out my knife and I was like, you did what happened next? He was like, I, I had to go into the bathroom and I just carved it on the wall. I said, what did you carve? He was like, ATM. Like, I would know what he was talking about. And I was like, ATM. And he was like, ATM. And I was like, automatic teller machine. And he was like, yeah, because you were just like spraying money, like just spraying money everywhere. <laughs> That's awesome. With your machines, you know? 
just like responses like that it's like you would you're not gonna hear that now yeah yeah that's yeah. crazy yeah. and you're not getting any spam phone calls yeah <laughs> <laughs> um that's yeah that's great i kind of wish i had seen all that stuff i was i, I was not uh involved in that at all i'm jealous of you guys because now it's like it's quite a quite a big scene with like the noise stuff right <laughs> It's weird. I feel like it gets fractured. Time. Yeah, totally. And, and I don't want, like it's, we have to, you know, you have to live in the now, but you don't want to be too nostalgic. But I do feel like at the same time that in the 2000s, it was kind of just this, like, I don't know, this like burst and boom thing of like all this weird shit. And maybe the time was just right where, um, everything was still kind of affordable where you could just tour and expect to get no money for a show and, you know, just split gas between like four people. And I don't know, there was like, there was every, every little town was, was ready to do a house show, you know, and there would be four people there maybe. And sometimes you'd be lucky and there'd be like 20 people and stuff like that. But it did kind of in retrospect, um, I don't know. It feels like something we maybe in the present, like there just wasn't a lot of, um, because people didn't have phones and stuff. There's just not a lot of, um, archive of it, you know, like a lot of it just, it just kind of was this vaporous movement that maybe is kind of only remembered by the, a lot of people who saw it firsthand. And that's, I mean, that's the case of so many things in, in, you know, our, our cultural history and stuff like that. But I don't know. It was kind of an, an amazing thing. Um, I remember one time being in a basement and just audibly hearing at the beginning of a set, buckle up. And that was just like the best <laughs> shit. You know? like, there, it is kind of like a weird, um, like it's a, it's, an, it's a fast route for like transporting people, right? Because like a lot of people who were kind of new to hearing, I don't know, abstract music or noise or something will always be like, you know, that set, if they didn't hate it, they'll be like, that set took me places, you know? So it is kind of like this fast route to disassociation, which I don't know if, if that's necessarily a good thing, but it is something of it. Um, do you find that? Yeah. I mean, it's extremely affecting. Just thinking about movies without music. Our drugs without music. It's like the music is really the most affecting part of everything, kind of. Um, and even if there isn't music, there's something like rhythm if time is involved. Like with comics, there's, you know, pacing and restraint and there's explosions and there's quietness and stillness and um, there's rhythms to all those things. And just, I think music expresses time in a crazy way where you have the time it takes for the music to happen, of course, but it can also represent a time in your life in the way that like a, a two and a half minute pop song or something, you know, Crimson and Clover or something, some et eternal feeling, you know, um, that just feels timeless and, and crazy and, but it still feels so personal and it's just inside you. Like there's just nothing else like that. Um, I don't really understand it. So yeah, with, with that kind of music, with that sort of experimental music, and then it's just pouring out of all these people, um, and these weird techniques and stuff. Um, it's that same kind of alienated majesty that you feel with other feelings, but the feelings are much more hard to describe and much more difficult to locate you know, much more fine in a way, which is what you find out, like, which a lot of people think is kind of ironic. But when you first start listening to noise, I remember asking Jessica Ryland why she started doing noise. And she was like, I don't know, just sitting there thinking, I hate myself. I hate the world. I want to make a loud sound. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think it starts there. And then in that static, you find so many colors, like this German word um, for the black you see when you close your eyes is Eigengrau, 
which means own gray, mm-hmm. like your own gray. Um, but just all of those colors dancing in there and all of those textures and kind of skeins and webs and gauzy things like just indescribable kind of like colors that you can't see, but you can hear. It's just really strange things that are, I mean, that's why we do it and why it just stays persistently, stubbornly interesting and valid seeming in terms of shows. I feel like back then it just still felt primal and alive shows still felt alive performance still felt alive and um, very fresh and possible these days. Sometimes I find myself wondering if shows in general are obsolete or the model of a show has to change where there's three to four bands and they go to the stage and there's the PA and they play and they, we all stand and watch them. And of course people experiment with this a lot. Um, and there's movement and there's all kinds of great stuff like that flocked and there's people going crazy with performance now, of course, but I'm talking about musical performance in this kind of ilk or whatever. I don't know the answers to those things. I mean, there's people turning out great perform, you know, there's Victoria Shen or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, There's still radical physical experimental electronic or noise performance or whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm just saying it's a different time. Yeah. And it just invites questions, you know? I mean, I guess the, the, you know, what I mentioned before is the fact that none of it's really archived because people didn't have smartphones is also obviously what made it better because it forced people to be present in the moment and confront that, time stretch you know when you're when you're in the set you know and you're kind of trapped in that basement um and forcing people maybe who weren't quite ready for what they were listening to to um just have to like relinquish control to um that that lapse or whatever um and then kind of create that well of disassociation or something or or maybe just Mm -hmm. hear those hear those um more intricate levels of it as well. Um, see the, see the, the many shades. Um, yeah. And there was no simulacra. There's no, um, yeah, there's no, uh, no analog, no, no avatar of it. Right. There's no meme. Yeah. You're not like, yeah. And you're not seeing a, a very, you know, poor video with yeah. like audio on a microphone that's mm-hmm. just like completely blown and this like tiny screen and it just looks like a bunch of red lights or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. It, it's like uh, you're always kind of well, in, in this time with, with shows that you're always kind of like a, like a scout or something. Like you're always looking for like that moment you can capture that like is then going to be like the object. Uh, whereas, so like you're always kind of like, uh, I don't know what the word is. You're like scavenging kind of for like a capturable yeah. thing where, and you're not really being affected by it. I mean, we're kind of like is, trained yeah. operatives of like the, right. the algorithm, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. But that's I mean, it feels that way. Um of course people still lose themselves in, in art and in music, but that screen is definitely there. Like uh Yeah. I don't know. It makes uh, when things are like really, really good, it makes them just like blast for it through even more though, which is kind of incredible. Like when it when it is just like an amazing musical performance now i think it's it's so it's so outstanding that like you kind of notice it more and it's just you're it draws you away from that that pull to like you know yeah be the the one of the many documenters or i don't know something but yeah i mean the music is good you know i don't have any problems with that i still see just just incomprehensibly good shit you know 
Um, definitely. Like, I never worry about that. Mm. I'm not really worried about any of this. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It's just, it is a, it's a defining question, and it's the kind of unanswerable question in that way where you can't describe the ground if you're, like, face down in it. You know, you're not going to be able to describe the landscape at all, and we're all just, like, face down in it. Um, you know, in one way or another. Yeah. It's, so it's going to take time for that to shape up and for us to learn from it. Right. It's, I don't know, it's interesting too because there's kind of like this, there's always going to be this element of amnesia, which is like a nice thing because people kind of rediscover the same processes and interpret them in their own ways, which is something you see maybe the most in like experimental music because it's just like, oh, I could do this, you know, function with this item and stuff. And, um, feel like a very productive artist like is there ever just a massive like lapse in your work um or do you feel like pretty consistently having a creative output there's always some kind of trickle but you know the lights get pretty low um usually it's that's pretty bad you know if things are are not going well creatively then um, then I get sick. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. So, I, yeah, generally I just keep it up. Um, even if it's just something that's pretty bad um, or seems pretty bad, I just keep doing it. Doing, I need to do something. So, you know, usually if it, if, at bare minimum, I'll, I'm drawing in a sketchbook every day or every other day or something like that. Um, or some other weird project will take over. Sometimes an event in my personal life will precipitate it where um, something bad has happened and I'm just kind of stunned and sort of taken out of stuff for a couple months, but I, I'll find something else during that time. Like I found uh, paper folding during that time mm. once. Mm. Um, and I just got really obsessed with that and I wasn't really drawing or making music. I was just doing that and you're in pain and then you kind of, something comes of that and you feel like it healed you. And so I think creativity finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> um I, wor yeah. I wonder about that sometimes, too, because there, ha there was a time where I despaired over music and I felt like what I was doing, that I had just been sorely mistaken about everything I was doing, that I'd been a complete fool. And on top of that, I had like caused pain and that um, 
almost like a feeling like I had to atone or something or just, I was just like, how stupid could you be? Like, look at what you've been doing. And I was looking at my friend's work in sort of the same way. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, this is not the way, you know, <laughs> I was like, I should be doing something decent. I should learn a trade. Like what the fuck am I doing? So at that time, I really did sort of stop listening to music. I kind of stopped making music, but then I became interested in CB radio. Mm. So then I got very interested in that. And then I built a whole radio station with, and got, you know, all this equipment and spend a lot of time on it. And very similar to music because it's just noise and voices coming out of the noise and, um, you know, d making homebrew gear and, you know, tricking out the radio and, it's just like working on synths. So hmm. that I learned from that too, because it just, just was the same urges transposed themselves and the same fascinations, but they were free of aesthetic associations and free of, um, you know, that public quality or that like, look at me quality. It was hmm. like that in a way, but it's like this very small demented group of people on there, you know, hmm. just yeah. like very, isolated that's, that's crazy Have you, did you ever hear anything like uh extremely bizarre on the radio oh yeah yeah i mean people had had crazy <laughs> fights on there people would admit crazy things yeah um you know people were on there pretty lit most of the time or no mm -hmm. i shouldn't say most of the time but sometimes late at night yeah um you know People, a lot of them would have like a shack, actual radio shack in the backyard, because some of these guys had directional beam antennas and concrete, you know, mounted in like co concrete slabs in their backyard and stuff with motorized things to turn them directly, like crazy mm. shit. Thousands of watts, um, <laughs> insane stuff. So they would go out there to escape kids, escape the wife, escape themselves. Um, a lot of them had no other outlet, you know, they're not musicians, they're not playing sports, they don't give a shit about anything else, they never gave a shit about anything else, they just mm -hmm. like work through the day, so they can get home, do their cooking, people would talk about recipes and stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's wild. I always love yeah. CB. Yeah. I always wanted to get one, I uh, never did. I got into shortwave stuff, I guess, but... Um, what was it like when you when you first like put your call sign out there? Were you like nervous or? Totally. I mean, it's just so weird. Plus, you're like, I don't want to. I've been listening to these guys. <laughs> you know, you set up and you just sandbag for a while. Yeah. And you're like, these guys are pieces of shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm gonna say to these fucking people. <laughs> um, but then after some months, you just kind of learn the vibe, and you check out different channels because there's like. There's one that's all guys that run crazy rigs. There's one that was mostly Spanish speaking people. There's one that's kind of older people. Um, there's one that's like really boring, like musician guys talking about their guitars and stuff. <laughs> um, so you can kind of pick and choose day by day. So sometimes you'd want to have a chill day and you'd be like, I'm going to go see what mother goose is doing and listen to her tell me about her grandkids or something like i don't really feel like listening to people scream that they're gonna pour paint thinner on each other's cars and <laughs> how many guns they have in their basement <laughs> you know? yeah um, there's got to be like yeah. tons of like preppers on there and stuff like i right uh, yeah yeah and there was meetups too like once a year they would have a meetup everybody would bring their cigars and their oysters and all kinds of gear people would swap gear and I don't know. Yeah. That's Sounds kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, I'm happy that that time happened for yeah. me, but it probably wouldn't have if I wasn't so upset about music at the time. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. I used to work at a, I worked in Delaware for like a while. Um, and it was across from a CB radio supplier. And I, I went in there to buy, um, a, a C crane shortwave and they were like, are you coming to the meetup? And I was the, the Patriot meetup. And I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know, but it probably would have been sick. I don't know. It was some weird vibes for sure. Just a bunch of confused guys really. Yeah. And a lot of them in a way, like they would never describe themselves this way and they would never even understand once it happened. 
happened if it happened, but they're really just kind of looking for guidance in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, and the gear they looks so sick, like, too. There's, like, lot, yeah, really, like, I don't know. There, Some, there was one I saw on there that had, like, a, and it was just called, like, the Satan or some shit like that. And it was, like, had yeah. crazy, like, red metal font and shit. There's lots of bad boy names, yeah. Mm. It's all very outlaw and stuff still. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's interesting. I mean, you're just blasting electromagnetic radiation. It's cra- it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Once you get up there with the watts and right. stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. Is there like, uh, is it like, why don't these guys just like use, uh, you know, their phones? Is there like a, like an outlaw nature to it? Like literally? Like, is it like, uh, it's like a code? sport. Oh, it's yeah. just like a sport. And, um, there's local channels, but then there's events, special events that happen because of celestial weather where there's sunspots mm. and those have a way of kind of pushing out electromagnetic energy to the ionosphere and it makes it more shell-like i guess is a way to describe it so the signals that would normally just travel through and go to outer space bounce off the ionosphere and bounce back down so you'll wind up talking to somewhere really far away Mm. another country or far across the country yeah and you can be running like very low watts and still make a really distant contact under those conditions so people will watch that People will make a big fucking meal. They'll buy a 32. They'll get a full bag of weed and they will sit down and they will work the fucking channels for like 12 hours straight. I'm oh, not yeah. kidding. That's awesome. Like you'll hear them in the morning. You'll hear them. They'll be on there all day and you'll hear them when you're going to bed. Like these people like live for it. And it's just a kind of sport, you know? Mm-hmm. And then locally, it's just who has the clearest, loudest station. If someone's talking smack, right. can you just key down on them and wipe them out entirely? <laughs> like lots of shit like that. Nice. So it's very oh. abstract, you know, um, yeah. and it's very just kind of like in a way became about using the equipment in the way like car culture or something would be like I built right. this car. It runs. I turned it on. I'm looking at it running. I'm really enjoying the fact that it's um, operating that's it you know it's just like it's tuned and it's like fucking satisfying so it's just a very like it's a mental it's a weird it's there's not it's not easy to explain logically that makes i mean yeah yeah, it's like a like woodworking or something yeah yeah it's satisfying to make something yeah yeah huh that's cool. Yeah, I didn't really know much about that. Now I'm going to have to do it, and I'll do that for the next two years, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. yeah. What did you, So you built your own? No, I would just modify shit. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. The radios are pretty complex, really. Yeah. Um, and then, there, you know, you get an outboard RF tube amp. Um, I had a few. Yeah. Um, huh. but there's crazy. things you can do naughty things you can do you know there's like limiting resistors for the mic you can clip so then you have like an impossibly distorted mic that no one can understand but it's very very loud you know <laughs> awesome. there's styles you know <laughs> yeah. there's styles of people frown on that work there's styles that work that people celebrate there's like all these different it's just like music you know yeah everybody yeah, runs yeah. their own station their own way and it says a lot about the person you know that's Does it. anyone like uh, set up like automated channels that'll just say like, you know, you could compare it to something like a spam phone call. Um, it's like right. Junk, like just no. like, ju- like junk information, just like constantly going out. It doesn't, the radios won't work well that way because they'll blow up if they're just like on, 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 on. Mm. Yeah. But people do use like all kinds of voice Actually, I have part of one right here. This is a voice scrambler. Mm, nice. I don't know. It looks like one. For yeah. CB. Yeah. yeah. Um, voice scramblers and other bullshit. People fuck with each other a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So why, why'd um, you hang it up? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think just because I got back into music. 
honestly. That's too bad. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I also, I lived in a house that I owned at that time. Yeah. So I could really just go stupid with, okay, this is where the hundred foot antenna goes. Like, and the coax goes right down the side of the house and right in here and just fuck everyone, you know, like turn off all the lights in the house, light a few candles. Nice. You know. Yeah. There's some ritual right there. It was great. Um, but then, you know, I moved and I moved on. I gave all the gear away. It was also my second run of it. I did it when I was in Boston, when I was like 20 or something hmm. off the fire escape. Cause we lived, um, near a highway. I've always been in a radio. That's like a whole other, I can talk about that all night. Mm. But, yeah. Yeah. Did that, uh, influence your like comic stuff at all? Did you, did that like, I feel like if you're spending so Big much time. time, yeah. Did that like come into Big it? time. I was obsessed, uh, yeah, with radio when I met Ben Jones, who's a cartoonist, amazing, brilliant artist, animator, kind of a genius dude, um, who was involved with Paper Ad, um, this collective, art collective. But uh, we did this weekly uh, comics newsletter, I don't know, one sheet, or it wasn't one sheet, it was just a weekly zine we did um, of comics, and that was called Paper Radio. And part of the reason it was called that was because he, Ben and a friend of his had gotten money from the school to start a radio station, but they had never done anything. <laughs> they just had a room allotted to them to have meetings. Um, they had no budget. They were just like, here's a room. Go ahead and figure it out if you want to. Um, we're not going to buy you equipment, but if you can figure it out, you can do it. So they just had this room where basically they would go and smoke weed and sit um, <laughs> and talk. There was nothing in there. There was just chairs. Um, but these two guys also drew comics, and that's how we became friends. And we all started making the scene together, so we called it Paper Radio. Nice. That's awesome. Um, but I was doing CB, CB at that time, too. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Huh. Have you ever fucked with like any other kind of radio stuff or radio phenomena like VLF or anything like that? It's funny you mention it. Yeah. I've been looking into some stuff like that. I'm definitely like have the bug, but there's more and more stuff piled up than ever that, I mean, I barely, I don't really have time to work on since even now for the most part because mm -hmm. um, of drawing stuff, but I have been looking at some VHF stuff and kind of some CB stuff. In the place where I live, too, we could put an antenna up, probably. So nice. My roommate's kind of interested in it. We've been talking. <laughs> it might be lurking. It might be lurking. That's cool. Yeah, you got to check back in, man. It might be like a return to Oz or something. It's just completely decimated. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I have I have a shortwave still here at the studio. I listen to when I'm drawing. I listen to ham radio still. Oh, nice. I have some crystal radios I've built. Um, I got into making some crystal radios a few years ago. Um, since I moved to New York, I've done that a bunch. Um, which is, you know, it's just listening to AM radio stations, but it's pretty nice in New York. Um, there's like a Cantonese station that sometimes will play modern. Uh, classical Cantonese music late at night, which is just like mm. really wild, just like sounds like cool electroacoustic music, basically. Mm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's New York, so there's a lot of radio. Um, yeah, I still listen. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. Did you ever do that? Like, there's like the, you know, like ghost people have like sort of a an, an understanding of radio, um, and like like electronic voice phenomenon. Like, oh. kind of, did you ever do the uh, like spirit box EDP. thing, where it it's like a like a hacked radio that just goes up and through the channels and then down, and you're supposed to hear voices? Did you ever mess with that? Yeah, the Tesla. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just helped a friend of mine um, build one. Hmm. Uh, whenever that was. I don't know, within the last six months. Um, yeah, pretty cool. That's basically a crystal radio mm -hmm. um, with a different kind of antenna. Um, and it's just, it basically just senses very minute changes in electromagnetic space um, in a very elegant 
delicate way that requires a lot of amplification. <laughs> yes, right. That leaves a lot of room for noise and a lot of room for, I think I just heard someone whisper, help me, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm down, you know, who knows? Yeah. And I think it's interesting, like at the time that that was popular, there was the radio waves were not full. Like the world was much more quiet electromagnetically. Mm-hmm. Like it's an uproar now. Like I don't know how sparrows or butterflies or bees or anything are functioning anymore. I guess they're struggling. But it was just a silent world in that way. Almost like the way there's like that uh, that thing that's in Walden about the first locomotive being coming through and how he could hear a disturbance in like far away, like birds far away, far, far, far away, screaming and then flying away. And then like slowly, slowly, slowly this wave of like reaction before he could even hear the sound of the locomotive. Like everything is so blended and mixed. And we know from making noise how thoroughly things can be hidden by just being on top of each other, no matter how loud they are. Mm. They just disappear and can like become confused. So it's just fascinating to think about that, that spirit radio thing because um, yeah, there was like a, an empty, there was, or there, maybe it wasn't empty, but there was like a quiet pond there, you know, a quiet pool. Mm. Yeah. It's just not possible now. Right. Yeah. I mean, and arguably with the Tesla, itself thing is kind of has a lot of lore attached to it but i guess he was using a kind of open crystal radio and that was that was bef- that was probably like right around the time that marconi invented the radio or because it was after and i mean tesla was realized about he had an idea of wireless power right right with this tower called warden cliff that he actually built right but he was obsessed with wireless but he was also just yeah he was on another plane so they he would, supposedly would visualize all of his designs in his head and describe them to the engineer in minute detail. Yeah. Yeah, so there would have been like no radio waves at all at the time that he was using that. I mean, I think it was it had probably just begun, but it was a special thing. It was like this orchestra is going to play. Right. At this time, it was like a concert on the air, you know. Mm. And radios weren't manufactured necessarily there was just designs that were printed in electronics magazines because it was that niche, but the designs were all for crystal radio. So the parts were cheap. You could do it. It was simple enough. Um, So that's how it began, which is also kind of interesting that they were just broadcasting, but there was no radios being manufactured. (laughs) It was just information for people to build these like simple little devices to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's wild. Yeah, yeah, and now yeah. they're like they're everywhere. Like <laughs> it's it's like everything is a radio. Everything, everything's a radio. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that and there's all like the magnetosphere stuff that you could pick up with radio too. It's calls into question if he was hearing like that that kind of stuff as well. Earth like very low frequency earth sounds and stuff like that. Can yeah. Yeah. Have that kind of like banshee like uh, whist with a whistling or whatever. Right. Um, there's also yeah, Constantine Redive Redive is uh, made a used like a spirit box that was a like a single diode, open diode radio, um, and he's like this interesting character because there's supposedly documentation of him like making contact after um, he died, and there's this whole group um what what is it called ben it itc uh yeah damn what are they called? well whatever the itf cf i don't know yeah. there's this An whole acronym. like yeah there's this whole organization that studies like um contact with life after death but through mostly it's like radio based stuff and actually this other person who was affiliated made this device called the spiricom which was um it was just like 12 oscillators. Um, and it was supposed to be like a, a medium through which, you know, a deceased person could tune the oscillators to create like a vocalization. I think it got, it turned out to be like an absolute hoax, but there's some really interesting recordings that came from that too. 
Yeah, I guess my initial feeling about hearing when I first heard about that was that's ridiculous. Like, that's it. When I think of a ghost, you know, I think of some ethereal, you know, some ectoplasm or something, some like glowing sheet, whatever, um, or something that's like closer to a heart or soul like energy, like not yeah. electronic, you know, not like mm. a. I don't know. But then when you think about that spectrum and you think about the unified field theory or something, all these forms of ideas are just different forms of the same energy or something. And that we have six volts in our brain, which is, you know, whatever that is, four double A's. <laughs> just chemically. Right. <laughs> yeah, right? That's all it takes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like a phone, a little, little more uh, efficient than a phone. Yeah. Or a little worse than a phone, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't seem that far-fetched in a way. But drawing it out of the, the hash and the trash yeah. is the challenge. Right, right. Tuning the noise. Um, yeah, that's an, I don't know. That's so strange. Like, people are still kind of taking cracks at that. Like, there's this um, device that's been in development and I've just kind of been seeing like talk about this in, in paranormal uh, chatter and stuff, but it's called, I think the soul phone. And it's like a device where you're supposed to be able to like talk to deceased people and stuff. Have you ever messed with like a Ouija board? Um, yeah, but not too much happened. It wasn't memorable enough. Mm -hmm. I think some strange, it, it felt weird to me. I didn't feel like this is bullshit. Um, I think it was more just, I was reluctant to ask any question because I was like, who the fuck am I going to talk to? And I don't really have any urges to talk to the deceased. Yeah. And if I want to, I just, you know, do what people call praying or whatever. If I want to like think about my aunt, I just, you know, yeah, kneel and, and breathe and think about her and, and do that so i don't know um yeah the the only the closest thing i have to a ghost story that's where we're going with this <laughs> is uh there was an apartment that my girlfriend rented my partner at the time rented with a friend of hers who was the partner of a good friend of mine so these two women moved into this place that had been sealed. Um, I forget for how many years, but it was at least 30 years. It was considerable amount of time. And it was owned by this guy who um, was a well-wisher and helper of the underground scene there, um, but had a lot of money and owned a lot of property. He used to go to Fort Thunder and had buildings where he let people have shows and he loved to have fun. So he owned this building. He was friends with our friend. And so he opened this apartment up for them because they were desperate for a place to live. He didn't know the story with it. It had been sealed since he bought it. Um, and the rest of the house had been actively rented that entire time. So it looked old. There was old wallpaper. It looked neglected, you know? Um, but there's a lot of places like that in Providence. And there's a lot of kind of old creaky warehouses and disused apartments and abandoned places and stuff that have lived or friends have lived. I've never really felt like any of them were haunted. Um, but that place always had a, a strange feeling, I think. And there was just this one simple thing that happened, um, which was my girlfriend had this dream of a kind of crone like figure, like an old woman. Um, it was happening in her room. It was like a lifelike dream. I was sleeping next to her. Um, so it was very realistic. And this woman was coming in and trying to grab me and, and drag me away or somehow like eat me or something. Mm. So she had to get out of bed and fight this um apparition i guess in multiple ways like physically but also internally and psychically 
So she described this dream to her roommate, and her roommate had had the same dream when Carlos was sleeping over, when her boyfriend was sleeping over. Um, and it, they only had the dream when we were there. Um, so then they did rituals to try to rid the apartment, and the dream stopped. They slept, I think, with some herbs and things. Mm. Yeah, it's a pretty effective ghost story there. Wow, yeah, that's good. Have you have you that's, ever heard of um, the stone tape theory? That's kind stone of stone like, ape theory. <laughs> the stone tape. It's stone like stone tape. Yeah, yeah I think my headphones are going there. This guy, this um, British archaeologist, was a uh, oh, like a tape is this is a rec- I mean a stone is recording yeah stone is a recorder yeah because yeah. it's it's weird like the 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 element of the story and that like it was sealed for so long it's kind of like somebody opened like the paranormal Tupperware or something but uh, yeah the stone tape theory is um, this archaeologist he turned into a parapsychologist and he was kind of making this unified field theory of why people experience like out of time hauntings and stuff like that. And the idea that like, um, events or, um, I don't know, archetypal things can kind of like record themselves onto spaces and, and have this like playback feature that can be, um, triggered. I don't know, by certain things disruptions yeah. and stuff yeah yeah i don't think that's very far-fetched at all i mean that's what a tape is anyway sort of mm. yeah um i had a, a professor that in school that that really felt that and then there's shinto or something mm. there's just consciousness maybe of different kinds um mm. and the sweat that i was at once um the person that ran that um, he told us that the stones had this, they had history and they had, they had uh, stories inside of them and that as the steam came out that they would talk. And of course they are like changing shape because of all the temperature differentials Mm, and making these like very, very quiet sounds that you could hear. And you, it makes you think about all the stress and all the coding that they've undergone already, you know? Um, maybe it was at one point uh, an igneous rock and then it got melted so much, you know, or it was sediment and it got compressed and then heated. And, you know, that's a, I, it's really interesting to think about rocks changing in geologic time in that way. Um, yeah. Also, I think about this, uh, you know, this guy, Alfred North Whitehead? Sure, yeah. Mm. Um, maybe for people who don't know who are listening, he he was a mathematician um, who came up with this equation that became fundamental to string theory by adding gravity uh, to uh, the tool set. But he also wrote these ideas that were were considered philosophy, or I guess they were tar- taught at, at Harvard, although I guess his talk there was the most left by the attenders who were all the faculty, just because they could not understand what the hell he was saying. <laughs> um, and even the person that wound up teaching his work there was a student who was almost an interpreter for the ideas. Um, and it, it has to do with causality, And this idea that, you know, the rain does not fall down and and hit the rock. Um, And the rock is not getting wet. It's like they're touching and they're, they've become like almost the same thing or something. Mm -hmm. Um, Almost like a reversal of causality, almost. It's a really weird idea. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That reminds me of it too. <laughs> yeah. There's also, uh, you know, like Richard Shaver, the like, uh, I don't, he was like a pulp writer, but his stuff was sort of, uh, publicized as true. He's like a favorite of mine. Uh, but anyway, he like later he became an artist 
or I guess he always was, but he focused on his art in his later years and he would cut very thin slices of like agate and then project light through them and would then sort of turn the features of that into these like supposed like records of like an ancient war, you know, like, uh, Mm -hmm. so there's like these monsters, you know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Or scrying. That's Mm. a thing too, right? It's a lot like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's his name? Richard Shaver. Yeah. Yeah. Those are his, uh, I think he just called them rock books. Like they were like these kind of like hyper object, like, uh, it was almost like a kind of, it felt like he was like gesturing toward like data storage somehow. Like these like stories were like kept on these slabs. Crystals. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. 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 And I mean, like sound is literally recorded into rocks and stuff at certain moments and, if somebody's laying brick and they're like whistling, the the sound is kind of etched into that in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's happening right now. Yeah, in the silicon. Right, right. Wherever it is, it's some server farm in Kansas or something. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and then just yeah, that idea of like liquidity of solids that if you go down to that scale where it becomes strings or even at the atomic level where you have this model of like these little bits flying around in empty space. And if you have the model of the atom at the football field thing, you know, where it's like these tiny objects in mostly empty space. And I don't know. I don't think it's very strange (laughs) to think, to think that, but it'll probably be a long time before we begin to use it. I mean, I guess we are using it in our own way. Hmm. Yeah. Or limited way yeah i mean there's a lot of value in the minerals they're mining that build all these ele- electronic objects um, yeah, we say this at a time too when the greatest the largest lithium reserve was found and to be in a ancient volcano in nevada wow yeah the largest in the world so lucky us we'll probably be changing up our geopolitical plans for the next 15 years a little bit doing some restructuring Absolutely. yeah oh yeah yeah huh. i didn't even hear it's about a, that did yeah you it's, that in the, it's in the yellowstone yeah <laughs> did you make that i did not it's in an ancient volcano huh it's like uh much larger than any other reserve which i think the largest was in bolivia or something like that but so it's not active it's yeah, no, the the volcano's yeah. ancient. Yeah. Yeah. So uh what else? What do you got what do you got going on lately? What are you working on? Uh today and later tonight, I'm working on a print for the show in Tokyo. I'm making a book called Gymnasium that's a sequel to the William Sofke book, put out by the same company, Anthology Editions. There's a nice collection of zines that spans they're like really early zines 2000 to 2010 that'll be a hardcover volume from new york review of books that comes out about a year from now and then there's a volume two planned which i guess will be out two years from now (laughs) for the next 10 years 2010 to 2020 nice that's awesome and uh nlp on psychic sounds that i just got the test pressings for for Universal Cell Unlock called Quasimodo the Street Sweeper. And then an LP for Hold called Rolling Gates. And then a tape for No Rent Records called uh, The Power of Misunderstanding. Nice. So, there, yeah, there's certainly no lapse in I think your that's everything. productivity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's I lo- yeah, I love yeah. that William Sofke book. That's maybe one of my favorites of yours that I've read. Um, it's It's very funny, but it's also... Yeah, I think you get into some of these kind of crazy concepts that we talked about in the back end of the show in that in that story as well. Yeah. Yeah, spooky stuff. Spooky stuff. So very exciting. Thanks for so much for uh coming on and and talking with us about so many different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was fun. We're yeah, going to play some sure. of your music on the show too. Okay, sweet. Maybe I'll send some stuff from uh I'll send you that no rent tape because that's so uh, new. Yeah, send whatever you want. Okay, cool. Uh, do you have like a link or anything you want to give, or just? 
I guess my website's pretty busted and semi non existent, but it's 333cf.org. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Awesome. .org. Nice. .org, yeah, yeah. Org. I'm organized. <laughs> yeah. Uh, organized well, organism. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and we'll be back next time. What a sign. Sweet. Resume. Recording in progress. Resume. 
Yeah, so we're back on Patreon. Um, Patreon. Patreon. <laughs> I wish they had a better name for their company. <laughs> no, wait, I can't say that. Oh, you're doing the fucking whispering thing. Okay. Okay. So that was a good an interview. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea yeah. what I just said about you. No, I guess I'll find mm, out. No clue. Um, yeah, that was fun. I kind of a different like realm of discussion, but it always kind of comes back to the same shit, which is fun too. Yeah, but it's cool because like, um, I mean, both are nice. I'm not detracting from either. Like, but when some when people come prepared with like something they're trying to talk about. Um, then it kind of like everything is focused around the orbit of that topic, you know, which is good. And, and I mean, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's totally true because a lot of the time, you know, more like paranormal ish researchers and stuff or, or whatever occult researchers will come on our show and they'll have that stuff, but it always goes off in different directions too. Um, but yeah, that was cool because it was just kind of open ended. And when you're talking about, the vagaries of artistic practice and stuff like that. It kind of leaves the door open for all of this other esoteric stuff. You can find this episode in its entirety and more exclusive content at patreon.com slash consensus on reality. It seems so crazy. I was always tempted, but it's like, you gotta go full...